Welcome to the Lend Academy podcast, episode number 287. This is your host, Peter Renton, founder of Lend Academy and co-founder of Lend at Fintech. Now, before we get started today, I just want to give everybody a heads up. We are rebranding the podcast. This is going to be the last episode of the Lend Academy podcast, and we'll be relaunching the podcast as Fintech One-on-One which is really a better description of what we do here. So I wanted to give you all a heads up that the next episode you'll see, it will be a new, there'll be a new graphic, there will be a new name. You should be able to get it just in your regular feed like you always have before, but we will uh, we'll have a new name. So I wanted to give everybody a heads up on that one. Today's episode is sponsored by Lended Fintech USA, the world's largest fintech event dedicated to lending and digital banking. Lender's flagship event is happening online this year on April 27 to 29, with the possibility of an exclusive VIP in-person component. The verdict is in on Lender's 2020 event that was held online, with many people saying it was the best virtual event they had ever attended. Lender is setting the bar even higher in 2021. So join the fintech community at Lender Fintech USA, where you will meet the people who matter, learn from the experts, and get business done. Sign up today at lendit.com USA. Today on the show, I'm delighted to welcome Brad Patterson. He is the CEO of Splitit. Now, Splitit is in the very hot buy now, pay later space, but they have a different approach to the other players. They allow a consumer to use their existing credit on their credit card to make uh, installment payments on purchase. We go into obviously that in some depth, exactly how it works. You know, we talk about what's involved on the merchant side. Uh, we talk about the risks involved, how they're able to, to do this technically. And uh, we, we talk about uh, the fact that, the, you know, why they become a public company, the, the recent uh, news that they they have a $150 million facility with Goldman Sachs. Brad gives his perspective on what he thinks interesting technologies for the future of payments and much more. It was a fascinating episode. Hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to the podcast, Brad. Thank you for having me, Peter. Great to be here. Uh, great to have you. So, uh, you know, I, I, I know you, you talk funny just like I do. So um, why don't you give the listeners a little bit of background about, you know, how you ended up coming to this country and just uh, highlights of your career today? Because I know you've been at some of the biggest names uh, in uh, in finance. So give us some highlights. Sure. Uh, happy to. Uh, so, I yes, I'm from Australia. I grew up in just north of Sydney on the beaches and I left actually Australia when I was 25, like 20 years ago, over 20 years ago. I spent a lot of time living in Asia and out of, out of Singapore, moving back. But during that time, met my wife, who is from the States. She grew up in California and about five years ago, she wanted to move home. And I was lucky enough to be working with Intuit at the time, who most people know as QuickBooks or, or TurboTax. And they asked me to move over here to run part of the business over here. So combination of family and work brought me to the states five years ago and uh, i love it here it's fantastic a lot of australians here and a lot of mm-hmm. innovation in california before that at 25 20 20 plus years in finance uh, financial services fintech as we call it now or in payments lucky enough to cut my teeth at visa in payments and then went across to paypal helped start paypal in, in australia and then across asia pacific spent seven or eight years there after five or six years at Visa and then moved into into it where I led the QuickBooks business and we again built that from scratch um, in Asia Pacific starting with Australia and then across Asia mm-hmm. uh, before moving to the States so a, a good breadth of I think cutting my teeth at Visa was brilliant to learn the payment system and then uh, a lot of building businesses after that Right, right, and yeah, I mean that's sort of a great background for a for a buy now pay later uh, CEO because you've hit some of the you know certainly some of the innovative companies in the space. But maybe you could sort of you know with with that background, what what made you decide to take a job you know at Split It you know after working at some of these big names? Things I love the product. I love that it was different. Uh, we are we see ourselves as complementary in the space. It's not a popular view, but a buy now, pay later product is essentially a new form of credit card. Mm-hmm. Those tra- they're financing the transactions at the point of sale. I think it's incredibly innovative. It drives financial inclusion when done the right way, and it's expanding the, the people that can participate, which is fantastic. 
it's essentially a new credit card though. What I loved about this model is it was the same, it, it was the same mindset applied to a credit card, which lets you use your existing balance on a credit card to pay over time. And it was, it was different. So the benefit, as I inspected that a little in speaking to a number of merchants and consumers, the benefit was real. And it reminded me of my early days at PayPal that this was like a really powerful benefit that people could articulate it with emotion. The product work, it just needed to scale. Right. And I think given the business model running in partnership with credit cards, it just allowed us to scale. And then it was a playbook we knew well from previous payments landscapes, which was really about execution, building the foundations to allow us to grow, but then executing with a really strong go-to-market plan. So those two things, strong benefits and a playbook I knew, man, it was about building the right team. So that was something that excited me. And so did, did Split It actually start in Australia or is it did it start in the US? It started in Israel, founded by two Israelis. Really? We're Interesting. Com- we're, we're complicated. We are founded <laughs> in Israel, uh, listed on the Australian Stock Exchange and headquartered out of New York. So right. it's, a, it's a complicated relationship. I think actually installment payments or buy now, pay later, you is, is ground into everything you do in Israel. You can buy the groceries for $15 and they'll ask you, would you like to split that? Interesting. And you can pay, split that into three installments, say, of, of $5, or I'm exaggerating, but generally everything you were asked at the point of sale, would you like to split it? Would you like to pay in installments? So it was born there, and the founders had a vision of how do we take that to not only to the rest of the world, but to e commerce. And it only works where it was a bilateral payment relationship. So taking that beyond that, making it agnostic, and then taking that around the world. So the founders worked on this for five years to build the, the architecture, the product, get the patents in place. And listing on the Australian Stock Exchange was natural given the success of some companies down there and building up buy now, pay later companies. The investment market just understood this product a lot better back then. Right, right. Yeah, Australia really leads the world, it seems, in, uh, in, this, in this nascent industry, but fast-growing industry. So, so then can you just delve into the product? I know you just you described it you know, a little briefly there, but I'd like to delve mm. into it a little bit about exactly what it is and what's the tech behind it and how it works. Absolutely. In the simplest form, we're allowing people to pay over time in installments using the balance they have available on their credit card. So let's imagine you're going to buy a bicycle for $800. You can purchase that bicycle now for $800 and you have to pay that off in 30 days time before you're charged interest on your credit card today, if you have the balance of $800. Or what we allow you to do is we say, let's say you want to pay that over time, 10 installments of $80. We'll place a hold of $800 on your card so that you don't overextend yourself, but we'll only build that card $80 every month. So you only have to repay the $80 before you pay interest or fees. We're not extending credit to you. There's a financial institution that's behind that credit card, which has decided how much credit you can have. We are placing a hold and we refresh that hold every month. So it's allowing people to purchase what they need or they want now, but without overextending them themselves. So there's no new debt or new credit at the point of sale. Right, but they do have to have that space on their card to be able to put the hold on, or otherwise you decline them, right? Well, we don't decline them. The issuing bank declines them, but yes. And I think that's what makes right. us very different. We're not extending credit to people. We're right. actually checking to make sure you have the credit then allowing you to use our technology to split that over time. It's interesting because yeah, there's I mean, all the other buy now, pay later players, you know, have a different approach, it seems. So they're mm-hmm. not they're not using existing credit cards. So so then like where where are you operating? But you, you you're you're in Australia or you're in well tell me what geographies you're actually operating in today. We are we're headquartered out of New York. Uh, the US is our headquarters, is where we're focused on on winning and where most of our team are based. Our technology team is out of Israel. Right. And then we have uh, offices in Australia and in the UK as well. But are you, is, is, as far as the, the market, are you going, is it just primarily in the US, US right now? We're actually, wherever a Visa or MasterCard is accepted or wherever a Visa or MasterCard is held, you can use Split It. So we have merchants in over 30 countries. We have shoppers in over 100 countries. Right. So I mean, Visa or MasterCard I mean, are in every country in the world, right? Exactly. <laughs> Pretty much. Exactly. So, That's what makes this different is wherever there's a, a credit card used or accepted, we're relevant. I think our focus in terms of where we put most of our time and effort is into North America and the UK and Australia, Uh, but we can be used and we do serve people all around the world. So how does it work then if 
so you're saying you can use it anywhere Visa and MasterCard are used. Mm-hmm. Like obviously you, you have merchants and I've been, I've seen some of the merchants where that's a very, it's a slick, it's a nice interface where you can just, you know, it gives you the option to pay in full or pay with split mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. But I imagine if you're, what, what happens if you, if you come to a merchant that, that, that they're trying to buy something where the merchant isn't with split it, how does that mm-hmm. work? Well, you, you, uh, the merchant needs to accept split it. So oh, what it we're okay. doing is we're building out an acceptance business and then educating consumers of what we do so they choose us when they see the brand and they understand that. So we're building out an acceptance business. They need to accept that. There's a number of different ways that can happen. Payment gateways are, are working with us to distribute our product and sell that into merchants. We're selling directly into merchants and we have a lot of demand coming in as well. So we're, really what our job is, is to build out acceptance and educate consumers to understand that. So when they see our brand, they understand what that does because we're so different. Right. Right. So do you, do you do any underwriting like at the time? Because I mean, obviously you're not taking credit risk because the, the, the amount is on the card, mm-hmm. but I imagine the merchant wants their money. So you're, you're fronting the money, I take it. And then mm-hmm. there is some risk, obviously that the person is going to close down their credit card or do, or, or, or just not pay. I mean, what, what is the risk that you're actually taking? It's minimal. And this is one of the things that makes our, our model unique. We're a technology layer. We're not essentially issuing credit or collecting the credit. We're a technology layer that allows this to happen on an existing card system. What does that mean? So we, um, so yes, you're right. Retailers, merchants, businesses want cash now. Right. Not all of them do. We have two models. Do you want the cash now or do you want it over time? More uh, It's a lower fee if you want it over time versus wanting that now. But we enable both models. We underwrite the merchants as they come in to make sure just your standard underwriting in terms of credit worthiness because we're extending you the money now, making sure that the products are delivered on time, et cetera. Relatively light touch though, given our model. On consumers, we don't underwrite at all because you're not actually issuing credit to consumers. The risk, I mean, the risk, we guarantee the funds to the retailer and to the merchant. So if you're a retailer, you want to receive your funds, we guarantee you'll get that over time. We'll take care of collecting that from the consumer. The way we do that is through the, we guarantee we almost guarantee that money through the hold on the card. If right. the funds are available, we know that's there, and every month we'll go and, and hit that card for a monthly instalment. So, what happens if the if the if that consumer tries to cancel their credit card during that payment period? It's no different to any pending authorization that you have on your card today. I think okay. that is that is held there, and if that's been approved, that's something that you owe, but it's not billed to the card immediately. Right. Okay. Okay. So, so then, so you really, you are fronting the money, but the, I imagine, so your losses, I mean, can you tell me are the, uh, like, are the losses very, very close to zero? Yeah, it's very close to zero. We say it's negligible. We don't report it because we actually didn't report it because there was really nothing there. We now say it's negligible because there are sometimes those authorizations fall over or different nuanced things that happen in a very complicated a nuanced payment system, but it's yeah, it's close to zero. It's in the right. single digit basis points most of the time. Right, right. So then, your your big challenge then is to is to bring in you know thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of merchants, I guess. Uh, so what ex- explain sort of the onboarding process that you go through with the merchants? Well, we're, so essentially, we're connecting to a merchant's payment gateway. So where the merchant is sending us the transaction. We're, we're putting that through our system, which allows it to be turned into an installment transaction versus a binary one. And then it's sent out back through the gateway into the payment system. So we sit between the merchant and the payment gateway. We're integrated and we're supported by over 90 payment gateways around the world. But every merchant that we integrate with, they need to set up a new merchant ID with that, that gateway account, et cetera, et cetera, and then integrate our APIs. So it is, oh, uh, we are improving the onboarding process now through a partnership with Stripe which means okay. that this can be done now in hours before it was taking merchants weeks or months to work with uh, their payment gateway to get this set up. So there are a number of payment gateways that will do this in hours or days. There are others where it can take weeks or months because of different systems that people operate in different ways. We're now bringing this down to be in a much quicker space, but we have a lot of work to do. We're not satisfied with how long it takes to onboard on the split. We're not satisfied with how simple it is. And this is one of our big focuses is to continue to innovate, to bring that down to, I can be accepting installment payments in minutes. Right. And I presume, I mean, I'd love to see what kind of difference you obviously you've got, you're working with a number of merchants already. Mm-hmm. And I know, that, you know, what, what is the, what, what's, what's the difference when you, when someone starts adding this, 
do you, do you, I'm sure you do have stats on what the lift is for their revenue and uh, do you have some sort of averages there you can share? We do. We have a number of case studies on our website. Uh, it's consistently suggesting that conversion rates with split it for retailers is nearly double. Some people will say it's triple. Some people will say maybe it's, 50, it's, it's one and a half. But on average, it's about double the conversion rate. The reason is we're allowing you to use the credit you have. We're allowing you to only do one. There's only one step of friction in the checkout process, which is choose a number of installments. That's it. There's no application. There's no entering personal details. There's no fear of that impacting my credit score because I already have the credit. So it's incredibly simple UX. The approval rates are over 80%. It's the same as a credit card. If you have the balance, it's approved. Uh, right. So we're actually convert, helping retailers sell more by converting existing browsers into buyers. That's leading to conversion rates of you know, two to three X improvement over the standard, which they're, they're translating that into 20 to 30% increase in sales and um, either through a much higher average order value or a much higher conversion rate. Right. And then are you seeing that, is this happening? Are most people buying through uh, through a mobile or through, a, through is it a desktop browser? I mean, what are the, what's the sort of usage on the consumer side? It's predominantly mobile, as you would expect. Uh, a lot more browsing on mobile than maybe completion. The pandemic changed this. We actually saw a shift back to the desktop. Right. It makes sense. A lot of us are sitting in front of a desktop at home. Maybe not all of us, but at least in front of a laptop, um, if not a, an iMac or something similar. Well, I expect that will shift back to mobile in time. I think there'll be an even bigger shift to mobile as we start to see the convergence of contactless and cloud-based checkout in the future. But at the moment, it's still predominantly mobile, but it's shifted back to desktop in the last 12 months. Right, right. Okay. Okay. When I was when I was doing a little bit of research for this, I was you know, browsing a number of different websites and I was surprised when I came across, I came across a, a, at least a, one that offered yours and one of the other buy now, pay later type uh, offerings, which obviously Absolutely. aren't using credit cards. So do you see yourself as complementary or how do, you, how do you view the other you know, buy now, pay later players? We do. We absolutely are complementary. We're often asked is how will, you, how will you compete against some other names in the industry? Well, we don't. We're complementary. We don't offer exclusive terms on our contracts because we don't believe that we're competing with those companies. And the reason is, is our, our customers taught us this. There are consumers and shoppers with a credit card that don't want to go into more debt. They want to use that existing credit they have more effectively. And there are people that need new credit or they need that to finance that transaction for a need or what they have in that moment of time. Those are complementary needs. They're not right. mutually exclusive. So we position ourselves as complementary. We think one of our, our partners, Purple, Purple Mattresses, great product, great brand. They accept, split it and affirm mm -hmm. for buy now, pay later type transactions. They position us brilliantly next to each other side by side they've articulated the difference between the two systems incredibly well as well which is one is for your credit card no application you can if you have the balance you can do it today and the other is financing apply for financing pay it over time at a, and an interest rate or no interest rate which is new credit to you i won't speak on their behalf but they've said uh, publicly that both of those products are improving conversion rates and, and we're doing it in different ways but both are needed because there are two different types of consumers that they're serving um, and two different types of needs. Serving just one is forcing people that want to pay over time into accepting or happen to get new debt. Or if you're only accepting split it, you're not serving everybody that you're only serving people that have the credit available. So we see them both as complementary and needed at the checkout. Right, right. Interesting. So then is it primarily big ticket items? I mean, are these $500,000 items? I mean, because you don't need to split you know, a twenty dollar item. I imagine. What's what? What are you? Where are you targeting your offering? Great question. We're wherever a credit card can be accepted, we are used. So we see tra we see transactions split between sixty dollars up to sixty thousand dollars. Wow. The the benefit of our model, maybe over others, is that if you have the available balance in your credit card, you can split it. So I've seen jewelry purchase for fifty, sixty thousand dollars into three installments. These are people that don't need to do that, but are choosing to do that. We've seen $60 shoes being split into six installments of $10 because people want to or need to do that. Now, where is the focus? I'll tell you one of the first things we did when I joined was look for product market fit. And the right. product market fit was really any transaction over $300. We started to add a lot more value. We're gravitating close to higher than that, but we serve anywhere. 
I think we had the most value over $300 up to $1,000. And a lot of our peer companies are complimentary. They start to max out at $1,000 in terms of the, the credit they will issue you for that transaction. So there's an unlimited. So again, that's where it's complimentary. But we, we, drive, we drive a lot more benefit $300 and above. Yeah, it's interesting because then also, obviously, the whole you know credit card game now. There's so many re- rewards that people are mm-hmm. people are focused on, and you know you get you, you're not you're not giving up your rewards, uh, even though you might not want to you might not want to pay that off. Um, mm-hmm. You know you can still do it. I really I can see how this is. Uh, yeah, because there's no there's, so you're paying the exact same amount, right? Whether you put it over six and is is there is it. Like, do you get to choose how many installments or, or, or how does it work there? You do. There's a different cost of funds uh, to us and then a different uh, fee to the retailer depending on how many installments they offer. So it's up to the retailer. They can offer a re- offer up to 12 and an exception to go up to 24 or 36 months. There's a different cost associated. It's up to the retailer. So that would build a business case that says, I only need to offer three and I'm driving conversion or no, I actually need to offer 12 installments to improve conversion, which comes at this cost. Most people that do this will run the math, a pretty simple ROI, and say so the improvement in conversion outweighs the higher cost for 12 installments versus three. But right. every individual business is different. It goes to their margins, what they need to achieve in terms of conversion improvements to justify that cost. Right, right. So then, so you're really, I mean, it's you're sort of a more of a, a B2B play, right? You're, I mean, mm-hmm. obviously, you know, you, do you have a consumer facing offering at all? Like, is it, do you have, I don't. I mean, I didn't think I saw an app. But do you, what, what, what is what is your the way? How do you interface with consumers as opposed to businesses? Yeah, you're right. We don't have an app yet. Uh, we are, we are predominantly B two B. What is consumer facing is our brand. Mm-hmm. These consumers need to understand who we are and what we do. And payments is very much a trust business. If I right, trust sure. you to process my payments and my money, uh, that you, you need to overcome that hurdle. Otherwise, you won't be successful. So we've made great leaps and, and strides in that space in the last 12 months. And part of us, what the way we're doing that is putting more of our efforts into educating consumers, building trust and helping uh, them feel comfortable that this is uh, a way for you to shop with confidence in a responsible way. So we'll continue to do that. We will not be issuing credit to consumers. That's right. not what we're here for. That's not in our founding principles. Uh, that's not something that we will invest in our IP to do that directly but we will invest more and more so in terms of giving consumers greater utility and flexibility as to how they use split it, whether that's in mobile or other ways as to how they do that. So it's, you're right. We are B2B that we need to be accepted. If we're not accepted, we're not relevant. It's not issuing credit and pushing you to places to use this elsewhere. That's a different model. Um, again, which makes us different to others in the industry. Yeah. Cause I imagine people might be at the checkout page and go, huh, that's cool. And like six installments, 12 installments, I never heard of this company, so they probably go mm-hmm. to a browser and type in split it and see what happens. So, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. so then, I mean, they probably you probably have that a lot where you know, it seems it seems reasonable. Let me let me let me give it a try. And then I guess but the thing is, once someone's done it once, I mean, do you allow the? I mean, I, I, I imagine consumers will then say, well, shit, I want I want to do this at other places that I spend money on a lot. I mean, how yeah. do you have like a consumer evangelist to sort of help drive the B two B? We are, we, so yes, but we're building that out now. So we're building out a marketing team. Um, anyone in, in marketing that is interested in joining a great innovative <laughs> <laughs> company, give me a yell. Uh, but we're building out that team now. Uh, we're doing a little bit of that now and more so this year. This is a new pillar in our strategies to really invest in this in 2021 and beyond. Right, right. Okay. But you're right. The, the, the number one thing I hear, I used to hear this at PayPal, believe it or not, back in 2005. Who's PayPal? <laughs> right. What do you do? I mean, you couldn't pass the barbecue test, let alone have consumers to have confidence in purchasing unless they used you on eBay. Right? Fast right. forward 15 years, you can't imagine that being the case. We're in a similar journey. It's like, who's split it? What do you do? So they'll research and we build confidence. But we are hearing and hearing more and more often. We have an MPS of greater than 65. And the people that know what we do and have used this, love it. And the question is then, why can't I do this everywhere? Yeah. I mean, it's, it just makes logical sense that this should be, this should be available. I mean, what mm-hmm. what is the competitive moat you're building? Is it because I this is, I'm, I'm just curious because it's it's a simple idea and it's amazing the idea wasn't around ten years ago, but it, it wasn't. So what what is the competitive moat you're building? First and foremost, which we don't rely on, we, but it is credit to where we started is our patents. We have patents right. which run through to 2032. It's 
it's an IP that the founders uh, protected early. And I think that, that makes it a scalable model that is low risk. Mm-hmm. Uh, secondly is tech debt. You need to connect to all these different payment gateways or build your own payment gateway. And that's not easy. Uh, so you need to, to build that and, and have that. And we've spent five years doing this, seven years doing this. And then is acceptance and understanding. Everything I just said about trust and acceptance, that takes time to build out as well. So right. we're on that last mile of this now of building up that moat. And this is really where we're investing now and in accelerating growth in terms of that acceptance and then understanding. Right, right. So I'm, I'm curious about, you know, you are a public company listed on the Australian Stock Exchange. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, I will share the the symbol for everyone if they can go in the show notes. Why did you decide to go public one? And why did you decide to go public in Australia? This is uh, predates me. So I'm going to tell you the story yeah. that I heard and I think it, right. it makes sense. And then we'll, we'll explain, we'll talk about Australia. The reason to go public was you're always looking to raise money to help grow the business. Uh, and that was either going to be in the private markets or was in the public markets. And I think given the work of some of our peer companies, um, for, especially Afterpay in building out uh, that product in Australia, it helped um, in the investment market there understand the buy now pay later space well in advance of other parts of the world. So it was just seen as it was a uh, the market understood that investors understood that and were more willing to invest in a, a company in this space. The fact we were doing it differently meant we had to educate why we were different to other people, but that's right. why. So that's why we went public. That comes with uh, a number of opportunities and a number of challenges in doing so. Why Australia? I think I, I touched on it. It's, we can talk a bit more about why buy now, pay later in Australia, but it's the ASX is where I think that was forged this industry and the innovation out of Australia in this space is second to none. Yeah, yeah. It's and it's really interesting. You know, I was just like, you've got Afterpay is worth you know, more than 30 billion US. You've got mm-hmm. a firm that's close to that. You've got Klarna, mm-hmm. I just read this morning, that is going to raise money at around a you know close to 30 billion so you got these mm-hmm. you got these monster valuations is that does that is that helping do you think that helps uh split it um to sort of you know or because you are you're obviously you say you're complementary but you're still mm-hmm. at the point of sales so mm-hmm. I mean, it feels mm-hmm. like the buy now pay later space it's the hottest space in all of fintech um mm-hmm. so is that helping you guys do you think Absolutely. Well, it doesn't hurt I think it doesn't hurt at all. I think we need to be clear. We, we have some work to do so everybody understands that we're a complementary option in the space, number one. So both known and then understood. And we continue to do that with the investment community here in the States and Australia and abroad, number one. But yeah, it definitely helps. I think longer term, will all of those parties still, that, that, that's the, that there's a battleground for consumer financing to issue consumers new credit. Right. We are not in that battleground. Yeah. We're, we're not there, uh, but there is a battleground there. And uh, I think people are backing different horses as to who's going to win that race. Uh, we feel that we're running a, a race alongside them but, and it creates great momentum for us to capitalize on, but we, we, we're not going to sit on our laurels and just wait for that to happen. We're yeah. going to grow in, in, with a different model. Yeah, speaking of which, I, I was just reading recently. You uh, you signed a hundred and fifty million dollar facility with Goldman mm-hmm. Sachs. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe and is that I presume that's that's to help fund just fund the the business as far as paying off merchants and that sort of thing. But uh, maybe explain what that money is actually used for. And was it important to get like a blue chip name, you know, like Goldman Sachs? I don't think there's any bigger name in finance than Goldman Sachs. Was that important to get them on board? It, so the 150 million facility is it's solely used for advancing funds to our merchants when they, right. so they can have the cash now and we'll collect it over time. So the, yeah. the more we grow, the more that we'll need to do. That turns into essentially 600 million plus per annum because the book turns over about four times a year. So yeah, okay. uh, and, and that's a three year agreement. So you're essentially looking at $1.82 billion worth of funds we can advance to merchants over three years. It was an important to, that's a very important stage of our growth as we're growing. We want to make sure that's there. So that's not slowing us down. And earlier yeah. in the year we had exploded in the growth and we didn't have that there. We fixed up with bridge facilities. Now we've really moved to partnering with a blue chip company such as Goldman Sachs that can provide us that. It was important for a couple of different reasons. One, I think that the partnership with a company like Goldman uh, enables us to grow on many different levels beyond the credit facility, not just there. I think they bring a level of expertise into the space, which will help us become enterprise grade versus where we're at today and evolve that quickly over time. 
Uh, and finally is uh, they're investing heavily in this space. I've seen that they've provided or funded a number of facilities. Mm -hmm. They're investing in this space. And I think that's a vote of confidence in our business that they see us as one of the players in the space that will be here for some time and will grow and they can benefit from as well. Right, right. Okay, we're almost out of time, but I want to get to a couple more things before I let you go. I'm interested in getting your thoughts. I mean, you've been around the payment space, you know, for, for a long time. And, mm -hmm. you know, we've seen the, this huge growth of buy now, pay later. You know, you've seen that the pandemic has caused a switch to debit. Credit cards mm -hmm. were down, you know, mm -hmm. total transactions down for the first time in, in a long time. Mm -hmm. what, what technologies are you pay paying close attention to? What do you think is going to, you know, rule the future of payments? And there's two different views. That. One is not new and one is uh, quite hot. Uh, the, the one that's not new is mobile. Uh, really looking at how will, will the way you use your device to pay, how will that change? And I think what we're seeing is there's going to be a convergence dramatically now as, as shops reopen, people re-enter the economy outside of e-commerce. Cloud-based checkout, cloud-based payments driven by your mobile and consumers initiating those transactions more than a retailer initiating those, I think has changed forever. And I think we're going to see a lot of evolution there. That's exciting for us because that allows us to take an e-commerce brand in store quickly and much more easily without in, you know, investing in infrastructure to do so. So I th we're watching that closely. We're doing a number of tests and working with some different partners in that space. The other area on the complete other end of the scale is blockchain. How do we use blockchain technology, not necessarily crypto, but blockchain technology to help us expand forms of payment? We operate on credit cards, but can you use that to operate with debit cards, with other local payment options around the world? How do, can you scale quick, more quickly globally with blockchain technology than what you could by using traditional payment means? So that's something that we're looking at in the early stages and we're looking at very closely. And then of course, we're looking at machine learning as to how you really turn your data into a, an asset that you can use to build better products for your customers. Yeah, interesting, interesting. Okay, so what is it about Australia and buy now, pay later? Is it just because Afterpay started there or is there something else going on in Australia? This is like Nick and, and Anthony built a, a brilliant product but innovation in Australia, in FinTech has been around it predates me and I've been around for a long time. <laughs> uh, there's a, you all know this, Peter, but some of your listeners may not. There's a great point of sale debit network in Australia called FBOS. Mm -hmm. And I've, most transactions in Australia will happen on that network. It's a pin based debit transaction at the point of sale. And then they were one of the first countries to move to contact or to chip and then to contactless. I think it's right. 20 million people versus 300. There's four banks versus no, 400. Uh, it's a relatively small ecosystem, but it's vibrant. The, 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 the economy is vibrant and it promotes innovation where you have a vibrant economy, you have a small number of people and a small number of players that can do that. It makes it also hard. It makes it hard because a small number of players can sometimes control it. But there is a, a, an Australian mentality of, uh, I think, uh, to battle against the odds and to find a way and to challenge the establishment. And I think that drive, that, that surfaces in the innovation. So I think all those things come together in the fintech space, which drive a lot of uh, innovation. Uh, right. I think there's a lot of great company stories out of Australia, but I think it all stems back to some of those points. Right, right. Yeah, fair enough. So last question then, I mean, what, what's on tap for, for Split It this year? What are you really, what are you focusing on right now? Serving our customers. Uh, we're really focused on acceptance, more people accepting the product. I think really leaning into a bit more product innovation now leaning into our consumers, into mobile, into a couple of other areas, uh, which we will release later in the year or as time goes on. And I think being clear that there's another way to pay. Mm -hmm. I think we have a lot of work to educate. We're not well known. And I think that we're starting to hit an inflection point where that is changing. Uh, people are increasingly knowing us. And I think the repeat use and the NPS is showing that there's, we need to be accepted more places because the demand is there. So our, our job is to not just accelerate that, but to really educate the industry, whether it's retailers or consumers, there's another way. You don't just need to go into new credit to make these purchases over time. Okay, we'll have to leave it there, Brad. It is really fascinating. You've got, uh, it, it's a great product. Um, you've certainly got a huge opportunity ahead of you. So best of luck. Thanks for having us on, Peter. Yeah, no worries. See ya. Have a good time. Bye. You know, as I was saying, uh, it's, it's amazing. This is a pretty simple idea. Amazing it hasn't been done before, but uh, the, the split it is really 
has taken the reins of of this, and uh, really the timing is is great. And we were, Brad and I were talking after we stopped recording, and you're saying, yeah, well, oftentimes it's a it's a timing issue, and where this 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 someone might have had this idea 20 years ago, but it would have been really hard to implement. And uh, today we have the technology, we have the you know the, the ease of use of checkout. People are used to now um, having m- multiple options of checkouts. You know, there's Amazon Pay, there's PayPal. You know, there's other other buy now pay later's. So they're they're more open, I think, to doing to doing something like this. And uh, you know, I mean, this is this is an idea that is is going to I mean going to have traction. Whether split it wins the wins this race, someone is going to be able to dominate the sort of pay and installments with your credit card space. Split it, obviously, have a head start and have a, a great shot at really becoming the default here. Anyway, on that note, I will sign off. I very much appreciate you listening, and I'll catch you next time. Bye. Today's episode was sponsored by Lended Fintech USA, the world's largest fintech event dedicated to lending and digital banking. Lended's flagship event is happening online this year on April 27 to 29, with the possibility of an exclusive VIP in-person component. The verdict is in on Lender's 2020 event that was held online, with many people saying it was the best virtual event they had ever attended. Lended is setting the bar even higher in 2021. So join the fintech community at Lended Fintech USA, where you will meet the people who matter, learn from the experts, and get business done. Sign up today at lended.com/usa.